Section 1 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Angel Child. Although Willemville was in no sense a summer resort, the advent of the warm season meant much to it, for then came visitors from the city, people of considerable confidence alighting upon their country cousins. Moreover, many citizens who could afford to do so escaped at this time to the seaside. The town, with the commercial life quite taken out of it, drawled and drowsed through long months, during which nothing was worse than the white dust which arose from every vehicle at blinding noon, and nothing was finer than the cool sheen of the hose sprays over the cropped lawns under the maples in the twilight. One summer the Trescotts had a visitation. Mrs. Trescott owned a cousin who was a painter of high degree. It had almost said that he was of national reputation, but, come to think of it, it is better to say that Almost everybody in the United States who knew about art and his travail knew about him. He had picked out a wife, and naturally looking at him, one wondered how he had done it. She was quick, beautiful, imperious, while he was quiet, slow, and misty. She was a veritable queen of health, while he, apparently, was of the most brittle constitution. When he played tennis, particularly, he looked every minute as if he were going to break. They lived in New York in awesome apartments where Japan and Persia, and indeed all the world, confounded the observer. At the end was a cathedral-like studio. They had one child. Perhaps it would be better to say that they had one child. It was a girl. When she came to Willemville with her parents, it was patent that she had an inexhaustible store of white frocks, and that her voice was high and commanding. These things the town knew quickly. Other things it was doomed to discover by a process. Her effect upon the children of the Trescott neighborhood was singular. They at first feared, then admired, then embraced. In two days, she was a begum. All day long, her voice could be heard directing, drilling, and compelling these freeborn children, and to say that they felt oppression would be wrong, for they really fought for records of loyal obedience. All went well until one day was her birthday. On the morning of this day, she walked out into the Trescott garden and said to her father confidently, Papa, give me some money because this is my birthday. He looked dreamily up from his easel. Your birthday, he murmured. Her envisioned father was never energetic enough to be irate unless someone broke through into that place where he lived with the desires of his life. But neither wife nor child ever heeded or even understood the temperamental values, and so some part of him had grown hardened to their inroads. Money, he said. Here, he handed her a five-dollar bill. It was that he did not at all understand the nature of a five-dollar bill. He was deaf to it. He had it. He gave it. That was all. She sallied forth to awaiting people, Jimmy Trescott, Dan Earl, Ella Earl, the Margate twins, the three Phelps children, and others. I've got some pennies now, she cried, waving the bill, and I'm going to buy some candy. They were deeply stirred by this announcement. Most children are penniless 300 days in the year, and to another possessing five pennies, they pay deference. To little Cora, waving a bright green note, these children paid heathenish homage. In some disorder, they thronged after her to a small shop on Bridge Street Hill. First of all came ice cream. Seated in the comic little back parlor, they clamored shrilly over plates of various flavors, and the shopkeeper marveled that cream could vanish so quickly down throats that seemed wide open always for the making of excited screams. These children represented the families of most excellent people. They were all born in whatever purple there was to be had in the vicinity of Williamville. The Margate twins, for example, were out-and-out -out prize winners. With their long golden curls and their countenances of similar vacuity, they shone upon the front bench of all Sunday functions, hand in hand, while their uplifted mother felt about her the envy of a hundred other parents, and less heavenly children scoffed from near the door. 
Then there was little Dan Earl, probably the nicest boy in the world, gentle, fine-grained, obedient to the point where he obeyed anybody. Jimmy Trescott himself was, indeed, the only child who was at all versed in villainy, but in these particular days he was on his very good behavior. As a matter of fact, he was in love. The beauty of his regal little cousin had stolen his manly heart. Yes, they were all most excellent children, but loosened upon this candy shop with five dollars they resembled in a tiny way drunken, reveling soldiers within the walls of a stormed city. Upon the heels of ice cream and cake came chocolate mice, butterscotch, everlastings, chocolate cigars, taffy on a stick, taffy on a slate pencil, and many semi-transparent devices resembling lions, tigers, elephants, horses, cats, dogs, cows, sheep, tables, chairs, engines, both railway and for the fighting of fire, soldiers, fine ladies, odd-looking men, clocks, watches, revolvers, rabbits, and bedsteads. A cent was the price of a single wonder. Some of the children, going quite daft, soon had thought to make fight over the spoils, but their queen ruled with an iron grip. Her first inspiration was to satisfy her own fancies, but as soon as that was done, she mingled prodigality with a fine justice, dividing, balancing, bestowing, and sometimes taking away from somebody even that which he had. It was an orgy. In 35 minutes, those respectable children looked as if they had been dragged at the tail of a chariot. The sacred Margate twins, blinking and grunting, wishing to take seat upon the floor, and even the most durable Jimmy Trescott found occasion to lean against the counter, wearing at the time a solemn and abstracted air, as if he expected something to happen to him shortly. Of course, their belief had been in an unlimited capacity, but they found there was an end. The shopkeeper handed the queen her change. 273 from 5 leaves 277, Miss Cora, he said, looking upon her with admiration. She turned swiftly to her clan. Oh, oh, she cried in amazement. Look how much I have left. They gazed at the coins in her palm. They knew then that it was not their capacities which were endless. It was the five dollars. The queen led the way to the street. We must think up some way of spending more money, she said, frowning. They stood in silence, awaiting her further speech. Suddenly, she clapped her hands and screamed with delight. Come on, she cried. I know what let's do. Now behold, she had discovered the red and white pole in front of one shop of William Melche, a barber by trade. It becomes necessary to say a few words conceiving Melche. He was new to the town. He had come and opened a dusty little shop on Dusty Bridge Street Hill, and although the neighborhood knew from the courier winds that his diet was mainly cabbage, they were satisfied with that meager data. Of course, Rife Snyder came in to investigate him for local barber's union, but he found in him only sweetness and light, with a willingness to charge any price at all for a shave or a haircut. In fact, the advent of Nelche would have made barely a ripple upon the placid bosom of Willemville if it were not that his name was Nelche. At first the people looked at his signboard out of the eye corner and wondered lazily why anyone should bear the name of Nelche. But as time went on, men spoke to other men, saying, How do you pronounce the name of that barber up there on Bridge Street Hill? And then, before any could prevent it, the best minds of the town were splintering their lances against William Nelchie's signboard. If a man had a mental superior, he guided him seductively to this name, and watched with glee his wrecking. The clergy of the town even entered the lists. There was one among them who had taken a collegiate prize in Syriac, as well as in several less opaque languages, and the other clergymen, at one of their weekly meetings, sought to betray him into this ambush. He pronounced the name correctly, but that mattered little since none of them knew whether he did or did not, and so they took triumph according to their ignorance. Under these arduous circumstances, it was certain that the town should look for a nickname, and at this time the nickname was in process of formation. So William Nelche lived on with his secret, smiling foolishly towards the world. Come on, cried little Cora, let's all get our hair cut. That's what let's do. Let's all get our hair cut. Come on, come on, come on. 
The others were carried off their feet by the fury of this assault. To get their hair cut? What joy! Little did they know if this were fun. They only knew that their small leader said it was fun. Chocolate-stained but confident, the band marched into William Milch's barber shop. We wish to get our hair cut, said little Cora haughtily. Nelcha, in his shirt sleeves, stood looking at them with his half-idiot smile. Hurry now, commanded the queen. A dray horse toiled step by step, step by step, up Bridge Street Hill. A far woman's voice arose. There could be heard the ceaseless hammers of shingling carpenters. All was summer peace. Come on now, who's going first? Come on, Ella, you go first. Getting our hair cut. Oh, what fun! Little Ella Earl would not, however, be first in the chair. She was drawn towards it by a singular fascination, but at the same time she was afraid of it, and so she hung back, saying, No, you go first. No, you go first. The question was precipitated by the twins and one of the Phelps children. They made simultaneous rush for the chair and screamed and kicked, each pair preventing the third child. The queen entered this melee, and decided in favor of the Phelps boys. He ascended the chair. Thereat, an odd silence fell upon the band, and always William Nelche smiled fatuously. He tucked a cloth in the neck of the Phelps boy and, taking scissors, began to cut his hair. The group of children came closer and closer. Even the queen was deeply moved. Does it hurt any, she asked in a wee voice. No, nah, said the Phelps boy with dignity. Anyhow, I've had my hair cut afore. When he appeared to them looking very soldierly with his cropped little head, there was a tumult over the chair. The Margate twins howled. Jimmy Trescott was kicking them on the shins. It was a fight. But the twins could not prevail, being the smallest of all the children. The queen herself took the chair and ordered Nelche as if he were a lady's maid. To the floor there fell proud ringlets, blazing even there in their humiliation with a full fine bronze light. Then Jimmy Trescott, then Ella Earl, two long ash-colored plates, then a Phelps girl, then another Phelps girl, and so on from head to head. The ceremony received unexpected check when the turn came to Dan Earl. This lad, usually docile to any rein, had suddenly grown mulishly obstinate. No, he would not, he would not. He himself did not seem to know why he refused to have his hair cut but despite the shrill derision of the company, he remained obdurate. Anyhow, the twins, long held in check and now feverishly eager, were already struggling for the chair. And so, to the floor at last, came the golden Margate curls, the heart treasure and glory of a mother, three aunts, and some feminine cousins. All having been finished, the children, highly elate, thronged out into the street. They crowed and cackled with pride and joy, anon turning to scorn the cowardly Dan Earl. Ella Earl was an exception. She had been pensive for some time, and now the shorn little maiden began vaguely to weep. In the door of his shop, William Nelche stood watching them, upon his face a grin of almost inhuman idiocy. Part 2 It now becomes the duty of the unfortunate writer to exhibit these children to their fond parents. Come on, Jibby, cried little Cora. Let's go show Mama. And they hurried off, these happy children, to show Mama. The Trescotts and their guests were assembled indolently, awaiting the luncheon bell. Jimmy and the angel child burst in upon them. Oh, Mama, shrieked little Cora. See how fine I am? I've had my hair cut. Isn't it splendid? And Jimmy, too. The wretched mother took one sight, emitted one yell, and fell into a chair. Mrs. Trescott dropped a large lady's journal and made a nerveless mechanical clutch at it. The painter gripped the arms of his chair and leaned forward, staring until his eyes were like two little clock faces. Dr. Trescott did not move or speak. To the children, the next moments were chaotic. There was a loudly wailing mother and a pale-faced, a gas mother, a stammering father and a grim and terrible father. The angel child did not understand any of it save the voice of calamity, and in a moment all her little imperialism went to the winds. She ran sobbing to her mother, Oh, mamma, mamma, mamma! The desolate Jimmy heard out of this inexplicable situation a voice which he knew well, 
a sort of colonel's voice, and he obeyed like any good soldier. Jimmy? He stepped three paces to the front. Yes, sir. How did this... How did this happen, said Truscott. Now Jimmy could have explained how had happened anything which had happened, but he did not know what had happened, so he said, I, I, nothing. And, oh, look at her frock, said Mrs. Truscott brokenly. The words turned the mind of the mother of the angel child. She looked up, her eyes blazing. Frock, she repeated. Frock? What do I care for her frock? Frock? She choked out again from the depths of her bitterness. Then she arose suddenly and whirled tragically upon her husband. Look, she declaimed, all her lovely hair, all her lovely hair, gone, gone. The painter was apparently in a fit. His jaw was set, his eyes were glazed, his body was stiff and straight. All gone, all her lovely hair, all gone. My poor little darling, my poor little darling. And the angel child added her heartbroken voice to her mother's wail as they fled into each other's arms. In the meantime, Truscott was patiently unraveling some skeins of Jimmy's tangled intellect. And then you went to this barber's on the hill? Yes, and where did you get the money? Yes, I see. And who besides you and Cora had their hair cut? The Margate twi- Oh, Lord. Over at the Margate place, old Eldridge Margate, the grandfather of the twins, was in the back garden picking peas and smoking ruminatively to himself. Suddenly, he heard from the house great noises. Doors slammed, women rushed upstairs and downstairs, calling to each other in voices of agony. And then, full and mellow, upon the still air, arose the roar of the twins in pain. Old Eldridge stepped out of the pea patch and moved towards the house, puzzled, staring, not yet having decided that it was his duty to rush forward. Then, around the corner of the house, shot his daughter Molly, her face pale with horror. What's the matter, he cried. Oh, father, she gasped. The children, they... Then around the corner of the house came the twins, howling at the top of their power, their faces flowing with tears. They were still hand in hand, the ruling passion being strong even in their suffering. At sight of them, old Eldridge took his pipe hastily out of his mouth. Good God, he said. And now, what befell one William Nelche, a barber by trade? And what was said by angry parents of the mother of such an angel child? And what was the fate of the angel child herself? There was surely a tempest. With the exception of the Margate twins, the boys could well be eliminated from the affair. Of course, it didn't matter if their hair was cut. Also, the two little Phelps girls had had very short hair anyhow, and their parents were not too greatly incensed. In the case of Ella Earl, it was mainly the pathos of the little girl's own grieving. But her mother played a most generous part and called upon Mrs. Truscott and condoled with the mother of the angel child over their equivalent losses. But the Margate contingent, they simply screeched. Truscott, composed and cool-blooded, was in the middle of a giddy whirl. He was not going to allow the mobbing of his wife's cousins nor was he going to pretend that the spoilation of the Margate twins was a virtuous and beautiful act. He was elected, gratuitously, to the position of a buffer. But curiously enough, the one who achieved the bulk of the misery was old Eldridge Margate, who had been picking peas at the time. The feminine Margates stormed his position as individuals, in pairs, in teams, and en masse. In two days they may have aged him seven years. He must destroy the utter Nelche. He must midnightly massacre the angel child and her mother. He must dip his arms in blood to the elbows. Trescott took the first opportunity to express to him his concern over the affair. But when the subject of the disaster was mentioned, old Eldridge, to the doctor's great surprise, actually chuckled long and deep. Oh, well, look a here, he said. I never was so much in love with them there damn curls. The curls was purty. Yes, but then I'd darn sight rather see boys look more like boys than like two little wax figures. And, you know, the little cusses like it themselves. 
They never took no stock in all this washing and combing and fixing and going to church and parading and showing off. They stood it because they were told to, that's all. Of course, this here Nell T.G., or whatever his name is, is a plum dumb midget. But I don't see what's to be done, now that the kids is full well cropped. I might go and burn his shop over his head, but that wouldn't bring no hair back onto the kids. They're even kicking on sashes now, and that's all right, cause what fur does boy want a sash? Whereupon Tresca perceived the old man wore his brain above his shoulders, and Tresca departed from him rejoicing greatly that it was only women who could not know that there was finality to most disasters, and that when a thing was fully done, no amount of door slamming, rushing upstairs and downstairs, calls, lamentations, tears, could bring back a single hair to the heads of the twins. But the rains came and the winds blew in the most biblical way when a certain fact came in light in the Trescott household. Little Cora, corroborated by Jimmy, innocently remarked that five dollars had been given her by her father on her birthday, and with this money the evil had been wrought. Trescott had known it, but he, thoughtful man, had said nothing. For her part, the mother of the angel child had up to that moment never reflected that the consummation of the wickedness must have cost a small sum of money. But now it was all clear to her. He was the guilty one. He, my angel child. The scene which ensued was inspiring. A few days later, loungers at the railway station saw a lady leading a shorn and still undaunted lamb. Attached to them was a husband and father who was plainly bewildered, but still more plainly vexed, as if he would be saying, Damn him, why can't they leave me alone? End of The Angel Child Recording by Anne